6. We're actually going to start in verse 1. And I'll go all the way through to verse 11. Well, half of 11. Once again, it brings up to uh, snuff. You know, uh, Hosea is the prophet to the northern kingdom of Israel. Uh, and uh, Jeremiah's call is to the southern kingdom of Israel. And, and time is up for, for uh, I mean, the kingdom of Judah. The, the time is up for the northern kingdom. They're going to be, God's going to split them up. And uh, the southern kingdom's got about 100 years left. And so Hosea was called by God to deliver this message that we're reading here in this book to this nation that is doomed. It's going to happen. He wants them to know how they came to this place and show them the reasons why God's judgment is coming upon them. Now, it's not a judgment that's going to come to a complete annihilation of the people. Obviously, there are people around today. The Jews are still around today. So not complete annihilation. But we see God's plan is to restore them to their land and restore them to himself. That's God's heart. He loves them. You know, Hosea, when we were in chapter 2, chapter 2, verse 23, says, I will sow for her myself in the land. I will also have compassion on her who has not obtained compassion. And I will say to those people who are not my people, you are my people. And they will say, you are my God. So he's going to sow for them. Like he's going to plant them. He's going to plant them again in the land. He's going to sow, you know, sowing of seeds. He's going to plant them in the land. And, he, and they're going to be his people again. And they're going to say, you are my God. These people who have been without a homeland, they went for almost 2,000 years without a homeland. God's going to bring them back into the land. That's what he's saying. He's going to bring them back. These people who the world has had no compassion for, and if you don't think that's true, just read the papers or the headlines. These persecuted people, God says, I will have compassion on them. I will tell them you are my people and you will say you are my God. Now we know that's going to happen at the end of the tribulation. So now we get to chapter 6 and we're going to see a little bit of a response to God's rebuke of them. So he says there in verse 1, he says, Come, let us return to the Lord, for he has torn us, but he will heal us. He has wounded us, but he will bandage us. You see, God can be severe in his discipline, but it is always for their own good. God can be severe in his discipline to you, but it's always for your own good. He doesn't do it out of, I'm going to get you now. Discipline is because he loves us. It's like a doctor telling somebody that has cancer, you need to get the cancer out. We need to go in and we need to cut the cancer out. And you say, but that's going to hurt. He says, yeah, it's going to hurt. But you're going to live. Mm -hmm. And that's what it's like. God's saying, it's going to hurt. You're, this one's going to hurt. But you're going to survive. You're going to make it. You see, God is our surgeon. And when he sees cancer in our spiritual lives, He's going to cut it out. And it's going to hurt. But it's going to be good in the end. He never does it to hurt you and I, but he does it to help us. He cares for us. Even when he wounds us, you know, it says there, it says, he will bandage us. I've been wounded. I've been bandaged. I've been restored. I've been disciplined. Try to stay away from it. But I understand. I know how it, I know how it works. You see, if they return to the Lord, 
if people, we, return to the Lord, if we come back to the Lord, we cannot lose. When you return to the Lord, there's no losing. You win. It's a win situation. Win, win, win. Surrendering your heart and your life to the Lord. Now, he's going to tell them when he's going to do this. In this next verse. He says, He will revive us after two days. He will raise us up on the third day that we may live before him. You know what? I read that scripture, the first thing I think of is Jesus. You know, two days on the third day, raised from the dead. And that, that's what I, you know, my, I first think of. But we have to remember something. In 2 Peter verse, uh, chapter 3, verse 8, it says this, But do not let us, this one fact, escape your notice, beloved, that with the Lord, one day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years is like one day. He says there, he will revive us after two days. He will raise us up on the third day. You know, the people of Israel, when, when they were removed out of Jerusalem, when, when they were removed out of the land, in you know, the beginning of, when, the, when the, he, the Christians first became Christians, and then at 70 AD, they got scattered everywhere, and the temple was torn down. It was like 2,000 years. If you take their calendar, 360 day calendar, which it was, you know, their biblical calendar is 360 days, not 365. 2,000 years, they wandered through the wilderness, and 2,000 years later, they came back into the land in 1948 of last century and became a nation again. Two days. In two days, he will revive us. And he's revived them in two days. They've become a nation. And on the third day, he will raise them up spiritually. See, right now they're revived, they're in the land, but they're spiritually dead. They don't know the Messiah, they reject him. They're just regular worldly people living in the world. But he's going to raise them up on the third day. On the third millennium, the third day, the third thousand year period, they were raised up. They were restored to the Lord, spiritually restored. You know, right now they still just don't believe in the Messiah Jesus. A few of them do, but not many. You guys remember the vision in Ezekiel? Ezekiel 37. Look, turn to Ezekiel 37. The vision that he had. It's just a, a you know, it's just a, such a good reminder. I was just going to tell you the story, but I would rather read it because it's God's word, and then nothing is missed when I read it out of his word. Ezekiel 37, start in verse 3. Here's Ezekiel. He's looking out on this dry land. There's all these dead bones everywhere. And those dead bones, as we look at it, they represent Israel, the people of Israel. That's, that's the dead bones. And so it says in verse 3, He said to me, Son of man, can these bones live? I'm going to answer, Oh Lord, God, you know. Again, he said to me, prophesy over these bones and say to them, O oh, dry bones, hear the word of the Lord. Thus says the Lord God to these bones. Behold, I will cause breath to enter you that you may come to life. I will put sinews on you. I will make flesh grow back on you, cover you with skin, and put breath in you that you may come alive, and you will know that I am the Lord. So I prophesied as I was commanded. And as I prophesied, there was a noise, and behold, a rattling. And the bones came together, bone to its bone. And I looked, and the old sinews were on them, and flesh grew, and skin covered them. But there was no breath in them. Then he said to me, prophesy to breathe, to breathe. Prophesy, son of man, and say to the, to the breath, thus says the Lord God, come from the four winds, O breath, and breathe on these slain. And they came to life. So I prophesied as he commanded me, and the breath came into them, and they came to life and stood on their feet in an exceedingly great army. You know that spiritual song, everybody's, you know that song? 
Yeah. Well, that's where it comes from. Well, he gives the interpretation now of this in, in verses 11 through 14. He says, Then he said to me, Son of man, these bones are the whole house of Israel. Behold, they say, our bones are dried up and our hope has perished. We are completely cut off. Therefore prophesy and say to them, Thus says the Lord God, Behold, I will open your graves and cause you to come up out of your graves, my people, and I will bring you into the land of Israel. Then you will know that I am the Lord when I have opened your graves and caused you to come up out of your graves. My people, I have put my spirit within you, and you will come to life, and I will place you on your own land. Then you will know that I, the Lord, have spoken and done it, declares the Lord. And here we are in 2019, and the bones got skin on them, and they're over in Israel right now, but he hasn't breathed life into them yet. The spirit has been breathed into them, not yet. But that's where we're at right now. We're at that place. Just before that's going to happen. We are living today in fulfillment of these prophecies prophesied thousands of years ago. It just amazes me. It just amazes me. Well, back to Hosea, chapter 6. He will revive us after two days and will raise us up on the third day that we may live before him. And we see it happening. We read the prophecy in Ezekiel. You know, and Matthew can read. I mean, it's just great stuff. Now verse 3 says, So let us know, let us press on to know the Lord. His going forth is as certain as the dawn, and he will come to us like rain, like the spring rain, watering the earth. Press on to know the Lord. Now press on. Get to know the Lord. Know Him. Read His Word. You know when you're feeling like low or, or empty or dry, like your dry bones, you know, or you you're, feel like you're in the desert, or you just don't feel like you're just right with the Lord, you know, it's, you know what? It's probably because you're not pressing on to know Him. You're not spending the quality time that maybe you had in the past. Like that's what happens to me. Like, oh, you know, I, mean, I, I can catch it pretty quick. I can see what's wrong. Well, because I've been around long enough, you know, I need to get back. I need to press on to the Lord. I need to be in that place. It's the end times. I don't want, I don't want to be in the wrong place. I want to be right before the Lord when He comes back. Press on to know Him. Guess what? And He will be like fresh spring rain. He'll be a, a breath of fresh air for you. When you press on to know Him, when you seek to know Him, He'll refresh your soul and your life. Your Acts 3 19 says, Therefore repent and return so that your sins may be wiped away in order that times of refreshing may come from the presence of the Lord. Times of refreshing. We used to sing that, a song in, our, in Truckee, you know, times of refreshing. It was a great song to sing. It just lifted you up and made you... Know, get to that place of times of refreshing because you know life could be so down. Times of refreshing are good. Being in the presence of the Lord. That's what life is. Walking in the presence of the Lord. Being in the presence of the Lord. You know. You've experienced it. You can be living your life however you live it or something, and you can come into this room and we can start to sing and you start singing to the Lord and all of a sudden you realize you're in the presence of the Lord and the troubles of the world seem to go away and there's a, just a refreshing in your spirit and your heart when you do that. For me, at least. And I'm not any different than you. Being in the presence of the Lord. But you know what? He's talking here to an unrepentant people. Israel. Unrepentant. That's who he's talking to. So he says to him in verse 4, What shall I do with you, O Ephraim? What shall I do with you, O Judah? But what do I do? I've done everything. I can. I, you know, I poured, I poured myself out for you. I blessed you. He says, For your loyalty is like a morning cloud and like the dew which goes away early. No, God does not enjoy disciplining them. He's not enjoying it. What must I do? 
You know, when Jesus came near Jerusalem, he wept. Luke 19, 41 through 44. It says, When he approached Jerusalem, he saw the city and he wept over it, saying, If you had known in this day, even you, the things which make for peace, but now they have been hidden from your eyes, for the days will come upon you when your enemies will throw throw up a barricade against you and surround you and hem you in on every side and they will level you to the ground and your children with you and they will not leave in you one stone upon another because you did not recognize the time of your visitation. You know, he says, I can't do anything else. I have loved you. And this is what's going to happen because you won't turn to me. We have to remember God is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. And it's the same thing with us. And hopefully he doesn't have to say to us, what? I, mean, what? I don't want him to say to me, what else, what else can I do for you, Jim? I don't want to hear that. You did it, Lord, you did it. I'm following you. Verse 5. He, said, he tells him, he says, Therefore I have hewn them in pieces by the prophets. I have slain them in the words of my mouth. And the judgments on you are like the light that goes forth. Hey, you know what? He's, there's not much more else I can do. What I what I do to get your attention, I send prophet after prophet to you. To warn you, to tell you. I give you my word. I warn you, I tell you. He does that for us, doesn't he? He did it for them. He says, I have sent judgments on you to get your attention. I don't send the judgments on you because I don't like you. Trying to get your attention. One of the judgments, one of the time I wanted, I wanted to get an example out of the word. One of the judgments that really stands out to me is in the book of 1 Kings chapter 17. Why don't you go ahead and turn there? We're going to look at a few scriptures there and in verse 18. The judgment of God upon the unrepentant people. 1 Kings chapter 17. Verse 1. Now Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the settlers of Gilead, said to Ahab, you know Ahab was the king at that time, you know he married Jezebel, and uh, they worship Baal and Asherah. They worship these idols. Um, terrible idol worship. Brought into Israel, God's people. So he says to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel, lives before whom I stand, surely there shall be neither dew nor rain these years except by my word. Drought is a judgment that God sends to his people when they are unrepentant. That's one of the judgments that comes in. Along with drought comes pestilence, starvation. I mean, it, it's not nice. Ahab was an evil king. His wife was even eviler. Is that a word? Mm -hmm. Huh? Yeah, more evil. Not evil or something, but I mean, we all understand. It. <laughs> you be evil with me. Three years no rain. Just, just think for a minute, okay? Three years, no rain in the leaves. That's a bug spray. Verse 1 says, Now it happened 
after many days, that the word of the Lord came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the face of the earth. So time's up. He's going back. And then in verse 17 and 18 of Kings, 1 Kings 18, he says, When Ahab saw Elijah, Ahab said to him, Is this you, you troubler of Israel? He said, I have not troubled Israel, but you and your father's house have, because you have forsaken the commandments of the Lord, and you have followed the Baals. Isn't that something? Ahab blames Elijah for the drought. It's your fault because you because of the drought. No, man. But isn't that how it works in the world? When somebody is in sin and they blame you for it? The Christian's fault. It's our fault. You know? It's God's fault. Well, Further down in verse, I'm not sure what verse that is, let me look there. First Kings 18. Last last Sunday night was funny. I called called out a verse and everybody went there. And, and then everybody's looking at me and I, I gave him a whole wrong book. It was an Exodus and I gave him something else. You guys are that. Okay, so verse. 30. Now what's happened is he decided to have this contest. You know, and the Baals, they did their thing. You know, we all know the story of the Baals. Uh, the worship of the prophets of Baal. They tried to get uh, their gods to burn up the sacrifice. And, you know, Elijah made fun of them. He said, hey, where's your god? The bathroom or what? You know? And now it's time for his turn, right? So it says in verse 3, Then Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me. <clears throat> so all the people came near to him. And he repaired the altar of the Lord, which had been torn down. Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of the Lord had come, saying, Israel shall be your name. So with the stones he built an altar in the name of the Lord, and he made a trench around the altar, large enough to hold two measures of seed, and he arranged the wood and cut the oxen in pieces and laid it on the wood. And he said, fill four pitchers with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. And he said, do it a second time. And he then did it a second time. He said, do it a third time. And he did it a third time. The water flowed around the altar. And he also filled the trench with water. So, you know, he's making sure that nobody can come up with a blowtorch and start to stand on fire. It's soaking wet, man. It's not going to burn, right? And then he prayed. At the time of the offering of the evening sacrifice, Elijah the prophet came near and said, O oh Lord, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Israel, today let it be known that you are God in Israel, that I am your servant, and I have done all these things at your word. Answer me, O oh Lord, answer me, that this people may know you. O oh Lord, our God, and that you have turned their heart back again. Then the fire of the Lord fell and consumed the burnt offerings and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces and they said, The Lord, He is God. The Lord, He is God. The big contest. And the people turned to the Lord. They repented and turned to the Lord. Of course, they changed again. But at that moment, they turned to the Lord. And rain came. The rain didn't come to the people repenting. Elijah went to the top of the mountain. You know the story. He went up there and he prayed, you know, told his servant, See anything coming? No, nothing out, nothing in the sky. Okay, he prayed again. You know, did, did it a bunch of times. And then he said, I see a little cloud on the horizon. Whoa, get up and run for it. It's coming, man. And, it, and then he outran, during the story, he outran uh, the chariot in, into where Ahab into the city. But the rain came when the people were there. God used the judgment to get their attention. And they were ready. And then when the fire came down, boom, but it did not last did not last. They went back to their old ways. 
In fact, he says there in verse, back to Hosea chapter 6, he says in verse 4, he says, at the end of it, for your loyalty is like a morning cloud and like the dew which goes away early. Just like the morning dew. Disappears, dries up. Back to their old ways. He's, he wonders, what must I do to get your attention, to keep your attention? You know, the Lord loves loyalty. He loves faithfulness. And those songs saying, faithfulness, faithfulness is what I long for. No, that's what the Lord wants. Faithfulness to Him. Then back to 5. Therefore I will hew them in pieces by the prophets I have slain them by the words of my mouth and the judgments on you are like a light that goes forth. For I delight in loyalty rather than sacrifice and in the knowledge of God rather than burnt offerings. Don't bring your sacrifices and your offerings to butter God up. You know, we looked at on Sunday night, we looked, looked at you know, the, the uh, Church of Thyatira and how they... You know, they had their indulgences and, you know, all that, all that stuff they did. They would pay for their sins ahead of time and they knew they were going to go to party and, you know, do some wild, crazy things. they go to the church and they would talk to the priest and they'd say, how much is it going to cost me to party this weekend so that my sin will be forgiven before I do it? It doesn't work. He wants their hearts. He wants our hearts. He doesn't want our money when the moment. He wants our heart. When David sinned, and he took Bathsheba, and then he had Uriah, her husband, killed. And then he thought he got away with it. And then he got busted. And he didn't get away with it because God saw and God called him. I mean, he wrote Psalm 51 after he, he got caught. His Psalm of Repentance. And in verse 16 and 17 of Psalm 51, he said this to the Lord. For you do not delight in sacrifice, otherwise I would give it. You are not pleased with burnt offering. The sacrifices of God are a broken spirit, a broken and contrite heart. O oh God, you will not despise. Humility before the Lord, brokenness before the Lord, God receives that. He accepts that. You know, Saul, when Saul was king. And you know, Saul started off, he was, a, he was a good king. You know what? It's interesting because people start off good in the Lord and then they end up somewhere else. Something happens and they, they get distracted or they, and boom, they end up somewhere else. And Saul was like that. Saul, before he was king, he didn't want to go before the people. He was kind of embarrassed and shy. And the next thing you know, man, he thought he was something. Thought he didn't have to listen to God anymore. And there was one time when God told Saul when he was going into battle to destroy everything and keep nothing. That was, he told him, this is what I want. You do this. It says in 1 Samuel 15, 9, after the battle, it says, but Saul and the people spared Agag, who was the king, that was the king, and the best of the sheep, the oxen, the fattenings, the lambs, and all that was good, and we're not willing to destroy them utterly, but everything despised and worthless, they utterly destroyed. God said, destroy everything. What did they do? Ah, you know what? This stuff's good. We don't want to destroy it, anyway, man. Why would we burn all that up? I mean, take it. God said, destroy it. He had his reasons for that. And then in the same chapter, for Samuel 15, 13 to 16, Samuel came to Saul and said to him, Blessed are you of the Lord. Saul says this to him, right? Blessed are you, I have carried out the command of the Lord. But Samuel said, What then is this bleeding of sheep in my ears and the lowing of oxen which I hear? Saul said, They have brought them from the Malachites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and oxen to sacrifice to the Lord your God. But the rest we have utterly destroyed. Then Samuel said to Saul, Wait, and let me tell you what the Lord said to me last night. And he said to him, Speak. Samuel said, not true. Though you were little in your own eyes, you were made the head of the tribe of Israel. 
And the Lord anointed you king over Israel. The Lord sent you out on a mission and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners and the Amalekites and fight against them until they are exterminated. Why then did you not obey the voice of the Lord, but rushed upon the spoil and did what was evil in the sight of the Lord? Then Saul said to Samuel, I did obey the voice of the Lord and went on the mission of which the Lord sent me and I brought back Agag, the king of Amalekite, and destroyed the Amalekites, but the people, some, some took some of the spoil, sheep and oxen, the choices of things, devoted to destruction, to sacrifices to the Lord you got at Gilgal. And Samuel said, Has the Lord as much delight in burnt offerings and sacrifice as in obeying the voice of the Lord? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice. Look at Saul making the, these excuses to God. Oh, you know, I mean, they didn't get the stuff to sacrifice the Lord. They did it because they wanted it. He let the king live, and he shouldn't have let the king live. And sometime during that period, you know, I told you the story before, when he let that king live, that king got a woman pregnant. And that was his, King Saul's demise years later. That descendant the one that ended up killing Saul. Your sin will find out your sin will destroy you. When I married Anna, that's the scripture that the Lord gave me. Because, you know, I rationalized, well, I don't want to marry her until I quit smoking pot and quit drinking and quit doing drugs and, you know, I, you know, I don't want to do that. And then finally, you know, I, I, I got so convicted by the, when I started reading the Bible, that's when, when the conviction came. I got to marry her. I married her. And then I would be delivering from all the drugs and alcohol and everything. And I, I just went to him you know, and a few days later and said, whoa. And he gave me that scripture. Said, Man, where did you live? What happened? And he said, it was better to obey than the sacrifice. I said, wow. So my life would have been a lot better if I would have paid you a lot earlier? Yeah. Whoa. Not that my life was terrible, it would have been a little more God-oriented. God he wants our hearts. He will never despise or turn away from a broken and a humble heart. Never. Well, verse 7 of chapter 6 of Hosea, he says, But like Adam, they have transgressed the covenant there they have dealt treacherously, treacherously with me. Just like Adam, they were disobedient. And if we're saying, Gilead is a city of wrongdoers, track of bloody footprints, and as raiders wait for man, so a band of priests murder on the way to Shechem, surely they have committed crime. And, you know, people just are just doing their own thing, they're just going their own way, and they're not turning to the Lord. They're not loyal to the Lord. This is how bad things have gotten. These two cities here, this Gilead and this Shechem, are cities of refuge. They were supposed to be places of non-violent places. Cities of refuge. Where see, in those days, what would happen is, if you accidentally killed someone, accidentally killed someone, the relative of the family member of the one you killed is committed to kill you. He's going to kill you. That's his duty. The, the relative's duty is to take you out. So the only thing you can do is get to one of these. There were six cities that God made cities of refuge in Israel. And th these two that I mentioned here were two of these cities where you could go and they can't touch you there. Now mind you, it's when you did it accidentally. It wasn't on purpose. It's a city of refuge how they're supposed to be. And not any longer. They're converting people there, and you know, it's just it's not a city of refuge. It's gotten so bad, even the cities of refuge, there's no place for protection. But they were places of, of murder. Their society has just went down so far. And then verse 10 and verse 11. In the house of Israel, I have seen a horrible thing. Ephraim's harlotry is there. Israel has defiled itself. Also, O Judah, there is a harvest appointed for you when I restore the fortunes of my people. 
Now that last part, that when I restore the fortunes of my people, I'm gonna just take that one out. We're gonna take that one next week. We're gonna end right there with also, O Judah, there is a harvest appointed for you. See, Israel is going to be judged, and he says there also, and Judah is going to be judged also. Both are going to be judged. It's happening. It's God's word. And God's word does not fail. And we can look at history, it's historical events. They happened, just like God said they were going to happen, they happened. When God says things that are going to happen, boom, God's word is true. And they happen. So, Hosea gives the, this message to them. You know, God, in this chapter here, is, is just like throwing his hands up and saying, you know what, I, I, I'm trying, I've done my best. I'm, I'm reaching out. I'm giving you warning. And you, you don't care. You're unrepentant. You can't hear what the Spirit has to say to you. So he says to the people. And you know, my, my prayer is that we don't get that way in our lives. We always agree with what the Spirit has to say to us. That we have repentant hearts. We have humility before the Lord. Brokenness before the Lord. Because that's what the blessing is. To be in His presence. Because His judgments are true. His discipline is real. There's no fun. So, Lord, we pray, Father, we thank you for your grace and your mercy. We thank you when you do discipline, Lord, it's for our own good. When you do it, Lord, just to get our attention, to draw us back to you. And I pray, Lord, if there's anything in our lives tonight, anything in our hearts tonight, we just need to confess to you, Lord. Forgive us, Lord. Forgive me, Lord, of my sin. Lord, refresh me. Refresh us, Lord. And fill us afresh with your Holy Spirit. For Lord, you are good. And your mercy and your grace, Lord, are wonderful. And we live in it. And so, Lord, help us to keep our eyes and the finish line on the goal, on you, Lord. To keep you first in our lives. To walk with you, Lord, in an intimate way. To know you, Lord. And to, and to represent you here on this earth, Lord. As your ambassador. The people can see you, Lord, and get saved. Thank you, Father. We know that's your heart and your desire for us, that you can use us to minister to others. So, Lord, thank you. Even now, Lord, use us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Let's sing one more song for you.